Mona Ataya is the founder and CEO of Mums World. She is a very prominent entrepreneur, CEO, and role model in the region. She was voted as 100 most powerful Arab women in 2013 by Arabian Business and 100 most powerful Arabs next generation in 2014. Mona's career started at Procter & Gamble and then at Johnson & Johnson, which is a great learning ground for her. Then she became one of the founding member team at Bait.com. She then transitioned to Mums World, which is an e-commerce platform, after she became a mother and she saw the need and the gap in the market. Her passion is to empower mothers and make a difference in the community. Mona and Mums World have won various awards and accolades that acknowledge the great achievements of her team and her contributions to society, especially with mothers and homes in the Arab world. Mona graduated with a dual honors degree in marketing and finance. We're absolutely delighted and privileged to be here with uh, Mona Ataya, who is the founder and CEO of Mums World. And as I walked into her amazing new office in uh, Dubai Design District in D3, I met this little person, and uh, this person has been absolutely inseparable <laughs> and will remain with me in the entire interview. And what this little person is doing for me is creating the, the, the warmth and the closeness and, and the playfulness, and, and, and the whole energy of this place is exactly about that. It's about happiness, it's about humanity, and it's about being able to find comfort and connection in our business environment. And uh, so today uh, we have a wonderful person. I have uh, had the privilege of uh, meeting her several times. And uh, she's built a great business. And we just walked around and met a few people there. And today we're going to go deeper into her life, her story, her journey, and into those moments of inspirations, uh, inspiration and special things that she has done. And I always call her Wonder Woman, and since the first day I met you, I've called you Wonder Woman. She's, she's done everything and achieved everything. So today we're going to sort of go a little beneath the surface and, and check her amazing story. Mona, it's a real pleasure. Thank you very, Thank very you. much uh, for having us over here and, and you know, just sort of looking after us and showing things uh, uh, with us. And, well, He's mine, <laughs> so he with, is your, indeed. with your he permission. Is indeed. He is indeed. Uh, but uh, you have all of these, these, these wonderful products and so on, and, uh, and this is your life. I mean, this is what you do. You, you make people happy, you, you connect with mothers, you, you, make, you empower little children. Tell me a few stories around this that you have. Okay. So Mom's World was built, as you rightfully said, behind a, a passion um, and a vision to create something that was important to me personally and to mothers regionally. Right. Um, as a mother myself of three children, I did not feel empowered that I was making the right choices or the easy choices for my children. So mothers um, are um, information hungry, they're risk averse, they want the best for their children, so they're constantly searching for information, for choice, uh, to make the right decisions to raise great children. Um, when I had my children uh, 13 years ago, Access to choice was limited, prices were very high, um, reaching the right product at the right time was also very difficult. Information about these products was practically non-existent. Um, Arabic information is non-existent. Um, so as a mother, I felt like my hands were tied. I was unable to find the types of product I needed to raise my children in the way that I wanted. And this is really where the seed was sown for Mum's World and how we built this business. Um, it's been five years. It's been a journey of, of passion, of joy, but also a journey of stress and tears and tremendous, tremendous uh, difficulty and troughs and, 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 and peaks. Um, so yeah, learned a lot in the past five years. I'm, I'm sure you did. Uh, so can we do a little uh, flashback in, in pure movie style and go to your, your, when you were a child? Uh, what are your memories from that time that, that you would like to share with us and what were the moments that changed you? Okay. So my childhood was a, a very happy childhood. It was a childhood of adventure, of sports, 
um, sports are very important to keep you engaged, to keep you motivated, to keep you competitive. Um, I was an athlete as a child. I, I was always proud that I was the fastest in my school. Um, I was the head of the Buckingham team in, in running. Um, I played tennis. I, I did horse riding. I was very active. Um, so my childhood was active, was happy, was competitive, and it was um, years of, of learning. And for me, my joy came from learning um, with everything I did. Your father played an important role, as I understand. And uh, what is the, the, some of the key advice that he gave to you and he shared with you, which has impacted your future? Okay. So the, the advice that has stuck with me throughout my growing up years was A, to always go after what you want and B, to take your highs and your lows in a level fashion. So when you succeed today, you should feel blessed and be thankful that you've succeeded. And if you fail today or drop and don't get what you expect, you should also be thankful and grateful and learn from it and move forward. So life is filled with the, with the peaks and valleys. Um, and your responsibility as a human being is to take it in, to learn from it, to be grateful no matter what it is, and to move to the next step. When you started out, uh, when was the seed of entrepreneurship sowed into you? Uh, and were there early, uh, any early moments where you felt that this is how I know I can make some money or build a business? Okay. As an entrepreneur, from my personal experience, you're never motivated by making money. If anything, being an entrepreneur, you're burning money. You're, you're taking the greatest risk of your life. You don't see the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel. As an entrepreneur, you're, you're diving into the deep end. <laughs> yes, so, so, yeah, so the reality is it's never about money. Yeah. Um, at least it wasn't for me. Um, I don't believe for me personally that the seed of entrepreneurship was ever sown at any one point in time. I fundamentally believe that life is about touch point that you build. It's a piece of a puzzle that you're building, um, you're building up. And as you prepare yourself with certain skills, with certain networks, you put yourself in the face of opportunity. And once you're ready for that opportunity, doors open. Right. And life has a way of opening doors for you when you can dive in or when it's the right time for you to experience it. And life has a way of closing doors when you're not ready. So the long and short answer is, I don't believe there's any such thing as waking up one day and saying, okay, today I decide to be an entrepreneur. No, it's rather opportunity has presented itself I believe I'm as ready as I can be. You'll never be fully ready in anything, but I believe I can take that leap of faith today. And whatever comes out of taking that leap of faith is okay, because I'm taking that leap of faith out of a conviction and out of a passion and out of the desire to do the right thing. And what's right for me is not right necessarily for you, but for me, when I launched um, Mum's World, it was about this conviction that we needed something for mothers to empower them. I needed as a mother to be empowered. So the, the failure element, the, the consumer frustrations that would come out of any startup, none of that really came to mind. The only thing that came to mind is the consumer mother is my most important target and I'm going to do everything in my power to deliver to her an excellent need or an excellent product mm -hmm. to satisfy her missing needs. Yeah. So is there a, a moment, uh, an experience in, in your young life which, uh, or perhaps a story which uh, you, you remember when you talk about uh, your life today? Okay. So a, a story that I do remember that uh, resonates and captures the way I approach most things around me is this notion of kind of creating your own fate and your own destiny. So the story was my, my father had traveled to the United States. He bought uh, a pack of these incredible uh, chewing gums called Hubba Bubba. And they're the gums that when you blow them, they, they create a bubble that looks like the name Hubba Bubba. They're gigantic. 
and we were so fascinated by that by that gum we couldn't get enough and we only had a box that my father had bought in and we were three siblings at the time we all wanted the entire box so my father basically gave each of us one box one one uh, uh, gum and said if you can sell another gum then you will have earned a third gum <laughs> okay. um, so out of desperation as a child, you're like, okay, I need that other gum. So you go out there and you figure it out. So this notion of figuring out anything is what guides my life today. Every day as an entrepreneur, and you know it, you face more challenges and more questions than you have answers. So every day you wake up and you say, okay, out of the 20 alien questions, I need to figure out an answer. And the reality is every question has an answer. Mm -hmm. Even if you have to create that answer that's right today. It may not be right tomorrow, but it's right for you today. Fast forward into your university days and then your first job. How did you get your first job? Okay. Um, I was walking through the uh, college campus. I was actually not planning on getting a job. I was considering doing my master's and I was walking past the career library and there was a poster at the, uh, at the door of the career library for the company that was my first company, which is Procter & Gamble. Um, and they were having a, uh, an orientation session or an intro session for graduate students mm -hmm. in the auditorium. So I decided to walk into the auditorium and listen. I sat at the very back of this very large auditorium and I sat there and I listened to the head of HR talk about how the company hires um, A students, mm -hmm. the creme de la creme of students, and teaches them how to create leading brands and how to build leading global brands. And at the end of the talk, I was so inspired and I thought to myself, that's the kind of company I'd like to learn from. So I walked down to the HR and I introduced myself and I said, I love this company. This stands for everything that I admire and I'd like to apply. I was an undergrad at the time, so I was parked to the side. Um, I did, however, send my CV and uh, Six weeks later, I had the job, and I was the only undergrad who had landed that job. So I've kind of given you the condensed version of, right, so of the story. In your first CV, what were the things that you were proud of? What okay. did you feel that they should hire you for? Okay. So I was, uh, I was an undergrad. My first CV reflected my part-time jobs in, in university. Um, so if you look at it from a, from a skill perspective, I was weak in skills. But what I did have, and I believed I was strong in, was a character profile that was ambitious, that wanted to succeed, and was thirsty for learning. And I needed to bring that to life. And so I spent a few hours in the, in the library trying to articulate, why is Muna different? What can Muna bring to the table that maybe someone else can't? Why am I even important to listen to? Um, and I had to be very honest with myself. And I had to say, you know, what is it that I can bring to the table? I'm super... I'm very hardworking. Um, I have, I believe, grit. Nothing brings me down. I'm an optimist. I'm, um, you know, I, I want to change the world. I believe the world can be great. I'm honest. Um, I'm driven by hard work. I'm driven by, you know, the, the, the integrity of hard work. And I felt these were character traits that were important to succeed. And I believed in them. And when you believe in something, then when you start articulating it on paper, yeah. it brings out something that's, I think, relevant. And the beauty is it might not have been relevant to other companies. It was relevant to Procter & Gamble at the time when I applied. Is that the sort of character traits that you look for when you're hiring people here? Only. I, own, I actually don't even look at the CVs. I only read their cover letter or their email. That's all I read. I was once walking in Dubai Mall. It was, we had just walked out of a movie theater. It was just before midnight. I got a, and I uh, get hundreds of emails a day. I had someone sent me a direct email with a cover letter and a CV. And I read the cover letter and I immediately, immediately at midnight emailed that lady and I told her come and meet me the next day and she's actually one of our hires. She's been with us now for three and a half years. So it was all about character. She was brave in her difference. So she articulated how she was different and that requires courage. 
That's the first. The other one, she was creative. She didn't come to me and say, hi, my name is X and, X and Y, I've done you know, A and B, and these are the skills I have. That's boring, because many people can have that. She was creative in the way she, she presented herself. She talked about what's in her heart, what's in her mind that's different. So creativity is very important. And third, and again, this came out of the letter, although uh, it's difficult to articulate it, it's this notion of, I am a person that is, 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 is in it for the long term. I'm going to learn and I'm going to continue learning and I'm driven, by, I'm driven by learning and I'm driven by learning with the objective of ultimately serving a customer. The, the average job life is about three years and you have four, five, six careers in your life almost and certainly more jobs than that. Loyalty has become a, a it's something quite unique. Do you put a high value on loyalty? Tremendous. Um, so I do not uh, interview people who have hopped jobs at all. So any CV that I've seen, um, they've stayed one or two years, typically two years, anything less than two years, repeatedly, I won't even see them. Uh, people who have demonstrated loyalty, um, in, particularly in today's world, is, is tremendous. You said five years ago, so this is post-crisis, uh, post, uh, uh, economic crisis here. I mean, you could have been doing anything. What possessed you to start from zero and you know, say, okay, I've got to do this and this is okay. that moment when you made that, that call? Okay. As a mother, I experienced firsthand the frustrations mothers experience. Um, as a mother, you are blessed with the, the opportunity to raise and to influence uh, other human beings. That's a responsibility. And um, I did not feel empowered as a mother. And the business plan for Mum's World was written out of that lack of empowerment. And I, I, I wrote, and I remember I started writing, and this sounds a bit cliche, I started by writing the business plan, and I wish there was. I wish there was a site that had everything I needed under one umbrella that I could search, compare, and buy. I wish there was a site that gave me real, transparent, objective information so I can make informed decisions because I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm a practical person, so I want to make informed decisions. I wish that I could find a community that I can relate to. So yes, I had my mother next door, I had my sisters next door, but as a mother you are a lonely human being because you have a responsibility that's only on you. So I wished I could find a community that I could relate to, that could give me advice, that could guide me. Um, and so the business plan was written behind that dream. And as I began to flesh it out, the business side of it, my entrepreneurial mind started, you know, started saying, this is a very important commercial business opportunity. And that's when I actually presented it to my partners uh, at Bait, and they loved the idea. Um, that leap of faith was a very difficult one, because I was a mother of three. I was overextended as it was. I had no time as it was. So for, I know how difficult it is to start a business from scratch. Um, and I had a lot of responsibilities already. So that tipping point to say, you know what, I'm going to do this. And I remember that tipping point was one thing and one thing only. And that is, I fundamentally believed that when I make this come to life, not if, but when, because you don't think if as an entrepreneur. When I bring this to life, it's going to create impact. And it's going to create impact even if it does with one mother or two mothers who feel empowered. I've done my job. Please explain your business model and, and the value chain because you've built a, what I would consider more like a machine, uh, and, and a high quality efficient machine. Can you just take us through that? We are that go-to destination for mothers to find the widest compendium of products under one umbrella, where they can search, compare, and buy. We have over 120,000 SKUs, of which 19,000 are exclusive to Mums World. We offer an everyday low price, because I know that mothers don't want fluctuations in price, one day high and one day low. We have 365 days a year, everyday low price, but more important, we have the best price guarantee. We are so serious about maintaining ethical pricing that if the mother finds it cheaper anywhere else and we haven't done our homework, she can call us out on it.
she can call us, she can email us and say, hey, Mums World, I found the 10 dirhams or 100 dirhams cheaper, match it. And we match it, no questions asked. We is, then, that, is that really your unique selling point that uh, people trust you that you can do that? So our unique selling points are, are, are multiple. One is nobody has the, the depth of catalog that Mums World has. Nobody has 19,000 SKUs that are exclusive to them as we do. So there are products on the website that you can't find anywhere else in the region. 120,000 SKUs makes us the deepest catalog in the region. Everyday Low Price tells the mother that we actually are parents ourselves and we know that raising a child is very expensive. And we have people day and night out in the market making sure that we're offering the best everyday low price. We have now 60, sorry, 600 suppliers and our relationship with the supplier is that we want the lowest price possible. If we haven't done our job and the a price is higher in the market, we will match it. That's how serious we are. Um, information. So you've seen our team of information in Arabic and English about the product. So mother needs to make informed decisions and we give her that informed information in Arabic and in English. And we deliver within uh, two to three days in the UAE and a week, five to seven days across the region. Now what's very important, um, when we started Mums World, um, the ecosystem of e-commerce was underdeveloped. I was so, going to do, ask you the, yes. that question because a lot of these things can be uh, developed. Uh, yeah. Yes, so I mean, the, the reality is for you to succeed as an e-commerce player, the ecosystem has to support you. What does that mean? That means courier services have to be able to deliver in two days. Yeah. Payment gateways online have to work. A technology talent has to be readily available. All of that did not exist. In fact, we have kind of fluctuated back and forth in working with couriers that maybe are not as reliable or as fast as we would want them to be or payment gateways that didn't uh, succeed. We are in five days from today moving to our own 22,000 square foot warehouse in DIP and another uh, 22,000 square foot warehouse in Saudi where we will be operating our entire supply chain ourselves. What does that mean to the consumer? That means you will no longer have to wait longer than two to three days to get your product. You will get your product in two to three days. You will get your diapers the next day. You will get your milk the next day. Um, and this applies to the entire region as well. So our supply chain management, because we're managing now everything ourselves, because we're big enough to do that, is going to be much more seamless. Ultimately, who's going to win? The customer will win in that experience. It's always fascinating for me uh, whether we compare uh, Uber with Kareem, or we compare Fetcher with, uh, uh, with FedEx. And when we compare you with other players in the market, um, you know, eBay, Amazon, and others who, are, who could potentially deliver this, what makes it special for you to be the people that I come okay. to? Okay. So globally, there's been um, one main horizontal. So the Amazons of the world are the horizontals. Mm -hmm. um, the online space is currently 45% sales in horizontal. The other 55% are with verticals. What is a vertical? It's a pure play, um, specialized retailer like us. Why is that even important? Why does a mother come to Mum's World who's a specialized retailer as opposed to a horizontal that sells everything? One is we have greater depth. We have a greater catalog. The second is we have a community of mothers. We have a million mothers on our website who are engaging. They're engaging on the website. They're engaging with us. They're engaging on social media. We have a mom's ambassador panel. These are um, moms who are talking about their experiences. So we have created not just a one-off purchase. We have really created a comprehensive 360 degrees community where mothers can access the products, the widest range, at the best everyday low prices, get them delivered to her super fast, and she belongs to a community where she gets information when she wants it, and she belongs to that community that can engage with her. So relevance is certainly one of them, because you're saying, you look at this community, language potentially would yes. be the other. And the word that comes to me in this technological age, and you actually have a technological platform that you're building, uh, is trust. And I always say that trust is really the, the currency of the future. Your thoughts, your comments on that? Um, at the end of the day, a brand is driven by what you promise to deliver, and what you promise to deliver has to satisfy a missing need, a pain point. So are you helping me fix my pain point? Mm -hmm. 
and the other is how are you doing it for me? What's the experience? So if I am fixing a pain point and delivering this you know, product, which is an exclusive one on Mom's World to you, so I fix the first thing, but if I do it in a horrible fashion, in a box that's dirty, if I'm late, if I've charged you an arm and a leg, then your experience with me has failed. So what I need to do as a brand is I need to make sure that I'm helping you address your pain point and do it in a way that's unique and better. Unique and better. And that's kind of what differentiates us from, from other players. And again, to be very fair, because e-commerce is still in its infancy, this is an evolution. We are nowhere close as mom's world to where we want to be. Nowhere close. So when, when I talked about the vision and what you know you dream, and the dream is really for mothers to have at their fingertip, at the press of a button, one press, that range, even the website guiding her in that choice and getting it to her faster, more seamless and at the best price and really helping the mother feel that she has truly been empowered to make the best choice for her, for her children. I mean, do you have a call center um, that responds to customer service uh, queries? Because I dare say you may get a mother calling in the middle of the night that my child's crying of colic or uh, a father saying that, you know, I need to deliver this thing uh, to my family. Do yes. you get those kinds of personal yes. experiences? So our call center works from 9 a.m. till 3 a.m. seven days a week. Okay. Um, and it's the largest department in the organization. And we, cater, we have uh, Arabic speakers mm -hmm. and English speakers. Okay. Now, moving into the environment of a lot of young people um, in and around our markets and the markets that you are serving, um, who are looking for jobs. And who are looking for a way of life. So my first question is, um, you know, what do you advise a young person looking for a job and what should they be seeking and what should they be doing? Okay. I'd like to perhaps address one point when you mentioned the word job, um, something that's very, very important and comes back to kind of the DNA of Mum's World when you asked me about what we're creating and why we're creating this. Um, you notice when you walked around the office, 70% of our staff are women. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of our executive level are women, not by um, design, but by uh, pure chance. We found phenomenal women at the sea level who are able to be heads of logistics, who are able to be heads of marketing, who are able to be heads of Saudi. Yeah. Um, and the, why did we find that? Because mothers can relate to us. Because we went out there and we said, I'm a mother, I have three children, our co-founder is a mother, she has three children, our head of technology is a mother, and guess what, you know, today at 3.30 I'm taking my son to Mary Poppins. But that's okay, because I can take my son to Mary Poppins and then work at my own time, because as a, as a mother or as a parent, your job should not negate your responsibilities at home, rather they complement. So we hire a lot of women with flexi hours. We hire a lot of women who work from home. We have a large a group of women who are in Saudi and in Jordan, even Palestinian copywriters who are sitting in the West Bank right. writing from home that we have under our payroll. Um, we held an investment round uh, two years ago just for women who want to contribute back to the workforce but don't want to leave their children. So that option to um, involve women into the workforce after they've had children is very, deep, uh, deeply entrenched in our DNA as a business. Yeah, so that is wonderful because I think you're empowering a lot of, we mentioned uh, Palestine, you mentioned Saudi, where um, a lot of young women who are seeking their first roles and their first jobs, that's the most difficult piece. Yes. What's the advice you give to them if they were to apply to you or to anybody else for that okay. matter? So I think the first job is a very important job for two reasons. One is your first job like your university or your school, to a large extent either opens or closes doors. So if you land a first job with a large multinational or a large consultant company or a bank that is recognized and admired, then you open doors going forward. So finding that initial big name is always helpful. I'm going to come back to that in a moment because the ecosystem is changing, but let me yeah. preface that first. The second thing is, where can you start your career 
and ensure that you are learning a lot. Because whatever you learn the first two to three years is gonna stay with you throughout your career. So I would never have been able to do what I'm doing now if I didn't have a crash course at Procter & Gamble or at Johnson & Johnson. That skill set that I acquired in these years of burning the midnight oil serve me today. Now, having said all of that, the world is changing. The jobs of today are very fast changing. Um, a lot of the jobs in my time are now obsolete. Finding that large consultant or large multinational is not necessarily the only way to go. So fresh grads can look for innovative startups mm -hmm. who are led by creative minds who are changing the world and learn from them. Would you recommend that young people start in a creative startup environment first and then perhaps look at big businesses or the other way around? Because I think uh, in our culture, uh, you know, you need to work for a big bank or a PNG or something like that and then you uh, yeah. venture outwards. Because there's this, there's this need that people, parents have, society sometimes has, that you've got to have a big brand with you. What do we need to do to okay. overcome that? Okay. So each experience will give you something different. A, a young startup that's led by super smart people who have a track record of success can teach you a lot. Yeah. And because they will throw you in the deep end as a young startup, you will learn more in the first month on the job than you will in a large structured kind of uh, hand-me-down environment. So a startup is very much like throwing you into the deep end of a pool and saying, swim. So there are benefits to that. Yeah but not for everybody. Because not everybody you throw into the deep end of the pool will be able to get out. A lot of young people are looking for that perfect job. My first job, I had to apply and actually physically visited 300 wow. uh, and opened doors in 300 places before I got my first offer. Do you think that young people now really breaking through need to sort of just say, forget the rules of the game, I want to work for Mom's World. I know where they're going. I know I'm going to be successful in this. I'm 21 years old. I'm straight out of college and comes to you and say, please, Mona, I'm going to, I'm going to wipe the floors, but I want to be here. Is that the kind of attitude we need? So we see that a lot with the, the young generation where they want to learn, they want to be part of something that's big and they want to you know, change the world. They're optimistic and they believe that the, the world is now their oyster. So yes, we see a lot of that. Um, and they don't want to be caught in the red tape mm -hmm. of, of large organizations. But one thing that I will add, um, it's, it's true to kind of our generation, but I think even more true to the younger generation, it really is not only about the concept and the vision that they believe in, they have to believe in and they have to be um, motivated by it, but it's about the people. You get a young person fresh out of college and you inspire that person, they look up to you and you mentor them, that person will stay with you for a very long time. So it really is about connections more than ever. Um, and you will find people who come on board who have great skill sets, but there's that, that disconnect that doesn't work. So people and connections. So if, I, if you ask me, what do I teach my three boys today? What's the one skill that I think my three boys need to have um, more than anything else? It's social, emotional intelligence and social IQ. Mm -hmm. More than anything else. Followed by grit as number two. But social IQ is more important than grit. It's interesting you say that because I talk about, I'm a, I'm a futurist and I speak about, uh, uh, about technology and changes in the future. And as uh, the world goes up like this in terms of technology and we have artificial intelligence engines and, and IBM Watson and so on, and I keep saying that the left side of the brain is going to be taken away by automation, but it's the right side of the brain that now gets enhanced, which is intuition and love and relationships and affection, emotional intelligence and stuff that you're talking about. Do you think our schools are doing enough to develop that side? I think the schools are now being forced to, to re-evaluate the way they teach. I see that with, with my children's school um, because no longer is a child's 
grades sufficient to determine success. They really need a much bigger uh, portfolio to succeed in today's life. Um, so are they doing anything today? I think schools are evolving very fast and we see that. We see that every, every year. Yeah. Now, do you have a mentor? Um, I have a lot of mentors that I look up to and that I go to for advice, for support and for uh, honest feedback. So the answer <laughs> is, is yes. Uh, are they generally older than you? No. Excellent. How many, do you have a younger one? Yes. How old is that person? Um, how old is that person? A couple of years younger than me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, where I was going to uh, in, in this particular thing is that I have one of, one of my mentors, I have several. I have peer level mentors, I have uh, senior mentors, but uh, one of the ones that I am doing a lot of uh, effort with and focusing on is a younger mentor. He's 21 years old, he's a Chinese American kid. Uh, he came for an internship um, from the US, uh, all the way from the US, he said, pay me nothing, I just want to come and learn. You know something, Mona, I learned more from him yes. uh, in the three months than he ever learned from yes. me. And that started me on a journey about reverse mentoring. That people like you and I need a mm. younger person sure. to be able to see the future. Sure. We can give them empathy, we can give them wisdom, we can give them guidance, but they can give us a view of the future that we don't currently have. And you have a young environment as I walk around. And there are a lot of young mentors there. Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts on this kind of philosophy? So there are a lot of people here at Mum's World, younger people, that blow me away at the skill sets that I see in them that <laughs> I don't have. Yes. So um, one of our very senior people in, in technology, um, she's, she, it's a she, she's younger. She has probably, if I had to kind of define the ideal social skills to succeed in a startup, mm. I'd list all her skills. Right. And I've learned more from her than, than many other people. Um, similarly, we have here older people who are more set in their ways, who are more black and white, because that's what they learned, who teach me or remind me of the structure. Again, so you, you find the balance with, with uh, different people. But I think I go back to what I said earlier about success today is really not about working in a vacuum. Today, more than ever, success is about creating community, community in your business and community in your surroundings and being able to engage in a very authentic way with the people around you. How do you engage authentically? Mm -hmm. So Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, these are not authentic engagement. Authentic engagements are being in an organization where you are driven by a mutual vision and you, you are excited by that mutual vision and you learn from each other's strengths and weaknesses and you respect and admire each other's strengths and weaknesses. I'd like to acknowledge a person who's actually sitting in this room. It's, it's my colleague, uh, Alex. Uh, she's a young producer and she's a, she's a content specialist. And uh, she joined six months ago. And uh, it was just basically, the answer was yes. We had instant chemistry. And what I felt in terms of her DNA and her attitude was, yeah, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to work, I'm ready to learn, I'm ready to understand. And really, she just evolved with us. And she's sort of, now she's really blossoming. And in these six months, um, and she's destined for great things. And I'm not just saying because she's here, but she's okay. destined to go right to the top. She's 25 years old. And what I find uh, in this kind of seamless process that she went through, is the sort of things that I'd like other young people to learn when they are looking for jobs. Because as your interview is going to go out of you know, 20, 30 million people who are looking for jobs. Uh, she could probably get a job, but she wouldn't get a job that she loves unless she went through this process. And I encourage people to do that. What are your sort of insights on that in terms of saying, let's look for something I would love to do, and then go out there and make the sacrifice and build with that. Build from scratch? Build from scratch. Do from you know, ground up. Young people can do it because there's just not enough jobs. And I was just going to get into jobs versus entrepreneurship. Mm. Mm. Um, maybe perhaps that's a good question. 
Um, and an entrepreneur, I mean, uh, anybody in a village is an entrepreneur, uh, you know, in, in our parents' sure. days, sure. times, you know, sure. you're a fisherman or you're a baker, you're, you know, you're doing something, you're a carpenter. So they are effectively entrepreneurs. A lot of young people do not have jobs today, mm -hmm. but they can all become entrepreneurs, they can all become freelancers, they can all sure. work flexi hours and stuff and find a, a malleable, you know, a flexible way of getting into the work, uh, onto the work ladder. Um, because that's what a lot of people are finding it difficult today. Because I feel okay. that, the, uh, that the social contract is mm -hmm. changing. I mean, jobs have not have moved away from becoming a human right. It, they, they are just something you do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, sure. I'm rambling a little bit, sure. but you know where I'm going. Yeah. So look, um, there's the traditional job and then the, there's the startup entrepreneurial job. And the entrepreneurial environment is not for everyone. In fact, it's for a select few. It really is. So uh, entrepreneurship has become kind of the, the flavor of the, of the decade. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur and everybody is an entrepreneur. The reality is less than less than uh, one digit percentile of companies that actually start up last the first year and even less last the second year yeah. so the the rate of success of startup companies is is, is staggeringly low and it's only going south um, it's an expensive exercise not only financial it's ex expensive emotionally physically mentally on your family it's not for everyone and that's i have to be very very clear on that so no one can answer the question on whether a job or an entrepreneurial direction is right for you except you. Personally, I made that decision to go down the entrepreneurial um, direction driven by a, an A, first and foremost, the team who was going to join me down that endeavor. So it was Rabia and Dani and Akram. So that team was my first tick. Yes. and was the biggest tick. So yes. had I not had people that I admired and respected and I knew that I could learn from, I would have taken a different route. That's mm -hmm. the first thing, the people who are your pivot. The second is being so passionate about the idea that you fundamentally believe it's gonna create the impact that you need to create the legacy that you want for yourself. Mm -hmm. So what is the legacy that Muna wants for herself? What do I want out of my life? And if this is going to get me closer to that legacy, then I need to do it. Regardless of the outcome, I've, I've gone down that path. So it's, um, is, is the idea important enough for you? Is it worth it? Um, and typically, an idea that's worth it is bigger than you. It's a social impact story. It's, yeah. a, it's an idea that, that impacts others. Um, and third, and very important, do I have the financial means and the skill sets to actually make this successful. So if I have no money in the bank and I'm broke and I cannot contribute, then I can't do it. And if I don't have the skill sets that allow me to bring this you know, off the ground, then I shouldn't do it. So these are the prerequisites for me as, a, as an entrepreneur to kind of hit the ground running. And as I said earlier, the timing was right. Had it been maybe two or three or even five years earlier, I wouldn't have done it because I wouldn't have ticked these boxes. So. If a person wants to do their own thing, they should ask these questions. Do I have the team? Do I have the money? Do I have the skill sets? And do I s believe so passionately about the idea? Because I'm going to wake up out of a 365 day year, I'm going to wake up 364 days of the year and ask myself the question, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> and I'm going to ask myself the question, how can I get out? And I'm going to tell myself, this is so difficult. That's a fact. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. So that's it on the startup level. So let's be very clear visioned on that because people who are out there saying, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm sorry. The reality is it's not what it seems. From a job perspective, and this is when young people come to me and they say, I can't find a job. And I say, that's because you haven't positioned yourself in the right way for the job that you want. Yeah. If I want a marketing job, I don't go out there and I start, I don't sell my you know, my, uh, my digital skills, or I don't sell my sales skills, or I don't sell my, you know, um, tech skills. I sell my marketing skills. So I need to do my homework, and I need to say, which company am I looking for? What are they looking for in a person? And what are the words, what are the skills that I need to bring to life? It's like a business. You know, you have a USP. What's yeah. my USP? Yeah. So people who have difficulty finding jobs need to be better trained. 
Absolutely, and I, and I think you, you, you speak very eloquently now about uh, due diligence, uh, about working on detail and, and, and actually preparing yourself. Uh, and I do a lot of that myself, and I, I, I totally resonate with that. Uh, we are living in amazing times right now because, you know, in this region we just had the, the souk.com deal with Amazon. Um, Fetcher is raising millions, uh, and, and Kareem is raising even hundreds of millions. Uh, what do you see in terms of the, the community that there's around us in e-commerce and so on? There's this, this energy there right now. What, you know, what are your thoughts on that? So look, we are, we are in a fast-changing ecosystem. Uh, that's the reality. Things are changing every single day. Um, good things and not so good things. Um, as a business, we are just focused, we have our heads down, we have our vision straight, and we're running towards our goal. So whatever is happening around us, some of it can help us, other things can, can hurt us, but we are just focused. Now, what I will say, and this I've learned kind of being in both the startup and the non-startup scene, is things are not always as they seem. Things are not always as they seem. So here you're sitting with me, and I can sit with you for days and days and days talking to you about all the challenges we face in building an ecosystem for e-commerce. That's not what, you know, the, the kind of the fad that's out there. The fad is, oh, it's all, you know, beautiful, and it's easy, and it's flowery, and it's not. It's not. So things are not always as they seem on, on all levels. Um, so... I hope all these businesses reach sky high, and I'm, uh, that will be great for the region, it will be great for the ecosystem, and I hope that more souks and fetchers and, and, and others come to the scene because we need that. We need success stories. We need growth stories. We need the region to evolve. We need the world to see the region as the, the pulse point of smart minds, of creative minds, of people creating things from nothing and having the courage to do that. And I think the time is ripe now. And these success stories, I just came back from the WEF a few days ago. Everyone's talking about these success stories. Um, so I hope this continues. I hope the momentum is, is just the beginning. Looking ahead, uh, Mona, where do you see this company going? What is your ultimate aim for it? We're building the largest mother, baby, and child company in the Arab world. Um, E-commerce is our starting point where we want to give moms access to the widest range of the best quality product found anywhere in the region. So that's the, the primary point. And really making her shopping experience as enjoyable and as seamless and as empowering as possible. So that's the first touch point. The second touch point is content. So we are developing our blog section that is going to give moms rich content around their purchases. So if I'm weaning my son or my daughter, give me some information that tells me about when I should wean my son or daughter, how I should wean my son and daughter, etc. So content is part of it. The other one is we have already become the go-to destination for a lot of the glo uh, global brands that want to reach the, the region uh, from abroad. So we are that marketplace for global brands to tap into the consumers of, of the region. Um, and then last but certainly not least, we want to be the indispensable online extension of her life through creating a community that she can relate to um, and, and, and learn from. Let's talk about some of the more human uh, elements uh, in terms of your life. What advice would you give to a 16-year-old Mona? I, I would start by saying that um, nothing beats the old-fashioned hard work, really. Nothing beats old-fashioned hard work. And it's, yes, quality hours, but it is quantity hours. It's just put in the work, keep on going. You're running a marathon, you know, you're not running the race. And stand up, go on, stand up, go on till you can't anymore. So, hard work. Running the marathon is a metaphor that I use regularly, but I think the world has changed into running the marathon in 100-meter sprints. <laughs> so yeah. it's become yeah. slightly different uh, and much, much faster. Um, the key word that uh, baffles this region and affects us all the time is the word failure. We don't understand failure, learning experiences, challenges, whatever you want to call them, but genuine failure. This region is very, very concerned with that. What are your thoughts on failure? So the definition of failure is, 
is, is one that I'm still not clear on. So for, in my mindset, if you like, in my mind, failure is, the, um, is giving up. That is failure. Is knowing that you can stand up today, yet deciding not to stand up. That is failure. Um, so in so far that you have a goal that you want to reach, because it's important, because you've committed to it, whatever the reason is that you need to reach that goal, you need to figure out ways around the maze to get to that goal. And just sitting back and saying, I can't be bothered, mm -hmm. that's failure. Yeah. It's the passive apathy that's failure. Wonderful, wonderful insight, thank you. Now, let's look forward into your future. Um, you know, you're a young mother, uh, your kids are growing up. Uh, how do you see yourself over the next 10 years? How do you see things evolving for you? I'm here to, to build a business that uh, solves key consumer needs and my joy and my success in that is being able to empower mothers to make great decisions for their children, like I am now empowered with Mum's World to make better decisions for my children. So that's, that's success for me from a business standpoint um, and growing this business to the giant that it is becoming. My success also in parallel and very important is my children grow up to be independent, autonomous, respectful, um, ethical, smart young men who are contributors to society. My older two boys are in one of the more competitive schools. They are straight A students, yet oftentimes I look at them and I say, is that enough? And the answer is no, it's not enough. It's not enough that they are straight A students. They have to be movers and shakers in a positive way. They have to have integrity. They have to be kind. They have to be kind. Um, they have to be likable. They have to be empathetic. It comes back to what we talked about earlier. It's that social, um, social equation that unless you have, everything else is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. What makes me a human being? And what makes me a human being are my relationships. Yeah. Nothing more, nothing less. Amazing. We are in a magical space uh, and anything can happen here because fairy tales are here. We have all of these wonderful products. So let's imagine we have a, a magic carpet. <laughs> And, and we get onto this magic carpet and we go on, on to your 85th birthday and we have come to celebrate your 85th birthday, your sons have come to celebrate that. What will we be celebrating? What has Mona achieved in the next many, many years? Okay. So um, I would first and foremost um, be delighted and be, uh, consider myself to be successful if my three boys came to me and they said, you know, mom, you were a great mom. So that's the first thing. And mom, you empowered us to empower ourselves. That would be true success. And um, the other success is seeing mom's world grow into an organization that empowers mothers, but more importantly has created jobs for the region for women of the region, for mothers of the region, for non-mothers of the region, and has given people opportunity to, to grow their lives the way they want to, whether they are entrepreneurs who want to come and, and change the world, or people looking for a stable nine to five job. Um, so really shaping the ecosystem through a business like Mom's World is absolutely uh, uh, imperative for me. So that would be written on your tombstone, uh Mona, who, who empowered a billion mothers, something like that? What would be written on my, what would I like to be written on my tombstone um, is Mona helped me change my world, change my life to be a bit better. Mona, it's, it's been an absolute inspiration. You've been wonderful, so thank you very much indeed. You've invited us, you've thank shared you. products, you've shared your team. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.